Welcome back to Devi DGENs. This is episode three. Uh, as always, I'm Noah Green and with me is Todd Vincent. And we're excited to jump in and chop it up with you this week. This week, what we're gonna talk about uh, in terms of strategy, what we're gonna talk about is thinking about how to value players in startup drafts. And this would also apply to trades based on their classes and Basically, the overall strategy we're going to discuss is uh, getting ahead on future classes to get more premium talent rather than um, taking players of lesser talent that are going to graduate, that are going to enter the NFL draft sooner. Um, we will, as always, do a recap of the weekend, some stock up, stock down, and then our next man up feature where we will each talk about a an incoming freshman from the 24 freshman class. Uh, so as that said, Todd, how's it going? How's the weekend? You get to watch some games. Yeah, it's good. I got, I got all the early slate in. Uh, fancy team did a little better this weekend too. So hopefully I start to establish some dominance in the DGN C2C league. I took a big hit last week. Yeah. Losing a nerds team. So this week we did a little better. I can't believe it. Hilarious. Uh, yeah, I got the I got some of the early slate games. I got to catch the Colorado game. Uh, still with Spectrum, I have no ESPN unless I find a way to stream those games. I I just have to say, uh, two minutes on Colorado and Dion. Like Dion is so good for college football, um, and the attention he's bringing to that program and just the attention he's bringing overall. Like the energy was insane there. I mean, they had Michael Irvin was on the sidelines. It was just, it was a star studded cast on the sidelines. Um, it is an unbelievable infusion of energy and talent that he's brought to that program. Um, and it was just, it's really interesting to get to watch that and just see the energy. I, I think that it's, I think what he's doing is incredibly unique. Um, and I think the way he's doing it is really smart. And he's just going to be a force for, for I think, I think a while. Um, and I'm interested to see how those players develop from a Debbie perspective and how their stocks stay. Um, but man, it was fun to watch. Just, I just as I just have to throw a plug in there. I just think what he's doing is so good for the game. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out on the recruiting trail too. Uh, like he's flipped some big recruits the last couple years, obviously Travis Hunter and uh, mostly some defensive backs and stuff last year. But once they start to get like an influx of offensive talent as well, it'll be really interesting to see. Yeah, for sure. And their offense is, I'm just impressed when I watch their offense. It's so modern. It's so fast paced. Um, they spread the ball around. They can run the ball as well. Um, it's just a really fun offense to watch. And I think you're right. I think recruits are going to watch it and say, I want to be in this offense. It's a, this is a modern future facing offense. Um, that's going to be really fun to watch. Um, so getting into it, uh, thinking about classes so i know this was a big a big focus of yours in the off season i know that you actually wrote an article about it in terms of uh debbie draft strategy and how you would approach it and about this strategy of moving to future classes uh to take more premium talent rather than sticking with the class that's about to uh be nfl eligible uh do you want to talk about that a little bit Yeah, yeah, I put this in one of my articles. I found this was like not only like one of the mistakes I would say for newer Debbie players and CTC players, as well as like a way to gain like a huge advantage in your drafts is to not settle for like the secondary and tertiary options from current draft classes and to target 
uh, like I called it like head of the class, like target your top ranked options in the sophomore and fresh, even the incoming freshman classes uh, to target those high five star kids uh, down the road. I think it's a big, a big thing where there's some kind of, I don't know if it's everyone is just risk adverse or there's like, I keep saying there's some kind of perceived safety in these guys that are going heading into their draft class. But it, it just doesn't exist. There's when you play Debbie and you play C2C and you're talking about these kids, 18, 19, 20 year old kids, the safety in longevity is that it's just it's just not there. And you see, you can see the bottom fall out in an instant from these guys, especially draft eligible guys. We saw it last year. We keep hearing the Keishon Butte and Zach Evans uh, examples. Go back a couple of years to DJU and Spencer Rattler were the top two guys off the board. Sam Howell was a super high pick his year. Like there's just, the safety doesn't exist and you gotta get that out of your mind. You got, you gotta not worry about getting all these guys onto your onto your NFL squad and just collect the most premium assets, whether it's two, three, whatever years down the road and be patient with them or use them in their value increases to supplement your NFL squad. I think the, the Perception is that you're going to have all these guys. You get these guys that are draft eligible, and you're going to have a lineup of five, six, seven of these guys, and they're just going to roll into your NFL squad, and then you're going to be set for a decade. And it's just never going to happen that way. Nobody here that's sitting here talking about it, no one that's giving you this advice, no one that's playing in your leagues is that good at it, or you wouldn't get to talk trades with them or talk with them or be in the same room as them. Like, it just doesn't happen. There's there's no way anyone is on that kind of level and you're kidding yourself if you think you're gonna you're gonna have that kind of a run yeah i think the idea it's and there's definitely i've seen it in in these drafts too especially when especially when you're doing the nfl side of the draft first and then moving into the college side or the debbie side you see this trend where it's really tempting similarly i think we would probably both have similar thoughts on dynasty startups uh, and the importance of taking talent and value and not filling your lineup. But I think the same thinking applies when people are doing Debbie and C2C drafts. It's like, oh, I don't have, I, I don't like my wide receiver room. It doesn't feel young enough. Uh, I need some, I need some young talent that's going to graduate next year to get into that room, to get onto my team. And you end up or I need a running back and I want to take a couple stabs at 24 class running backs. And then you end up passing on potentially premium talent in order to just plug a need. But on the Debbie side, that's even, that's even more tenuous than it is if you're doing it in a, in an NFL dynasty draft. Um, or even if you're trying to acquire draft picks, which are locked in Th these Debbie players, just, they fluctuate so much and if you're not getting absolutely premium talent then you may as well you may as well not draft those guys and actually take some younger guys we made a little list so we were thinking about this in terms of the 25 wide receiver class versus the 24 running back class which is a really interesting breakdown to look at in terms of where those guys were in debbie and c2c adp versus kind of where they are now. Um, and I actually um, actually pulled it up. Um, so just looking at looking at the campus to Canton ADP rankings, uh, which again, a, a, ADP for Debbie is hard to find because there's so many drafts happening in spreadsheets. But when you look in the first round, you've got I'm just going to drop some average ADPs. Travion Henderson 5.2 Raheem Sanders, 5.3. Braylon Allen, 9.7. Um, Will Shipley, 16.8. Uh, that's four, four 24 running backs. Then you go to Donovan Edwards, 23. Um, you've got a bunch of those running backs from the 24 class there. And then let's go to the 25 receiver class where Luther Burden had average ADP 16.3, Evan Stewart 17.8. Um, going on, Antonio Williams 23.7, Barry and Brown 23.8. And my guy, who is my most rostered C2C Debbie player, Tet McMillan at 
39.8. When you hear those numbers, what 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 do you how do you react to that? Yeah, it, it's kind of crazy. And I mean, you can say it's like uh, hindsight now, but I've been preaching this all off season, uh, and it's just the way I prefer to draft. But these guys, like the five star receivers, and none of these guys are there's none of them are secrets. They all had pretty like pretty big breakout freshman seasons. Uh, and there was still pushback on them, especially Luther Burden was a guy we heard a lot about, which there's there's legitimate questions about his long-term usage in the NFL, but you can't question his athleticism, his size, his pedigree. Uh, he put up he the way he was used last year, they showed they wanted to get him involved. He was like the secondary focus of the offense there. Uh, Evan Stewart was a five-star kid who smashed last year. Ted McMillan had a massive like 700 and something yards and uh, nine touchdowns as a freshman. Like the, all the signs were there. And even going back and doing mock drafts this year and doing rankings and stuff, I had these guys like I think all of them, even up to Barry and Brown, like at the end of first rounds in Debbie drafts because their, their seasons they've had, the value they're going to hold and projecting them forward to be first round draft picks is an easier task to me than knowing what the NFL is going to think of these running backs, which we've seen over and over and over again, which is being beside this year where Gibbs and Bijan went is being devalued. And I think even with like, even Travion, who's still my RB one and still a guy I believe in, because I think his traits are different than anyone else in the draft. Even him, he still has to be healthy and provide something down the stretch here for Ohio state to get back in or stay in the conversation of a round two pick. And he was thought to be like this massive prospect coming out of high school. The rest of the guys are all projections of guys I wasn't high on in the first place. Uh, and that's, it's a perfect example of guys taking like once you get past rocket Sanders and um, Braylon Allen, who I was not, I'm not high on and I've been vocal about it that I'm not high on his NFL aspects. Then the guys that list gets smaller and smaller, but people just seem to want to push these guys up. I don't know if it's people are, like I said, risk averse or just people are more inclined to be entrenched in like the draft process as well. So they want to be higher up and on these guys when draft season comes around, but we're pushing up guys like Trey Benson and uh donovan edwards and stuff and these guys were like Bucky a high recruit, but trey benson was like a three-star recruit who popped last year in his i think third season or maybe fourth year in college on a on his second team and all of a sudden he had like, like a four or five game stretch where he was really good down the stretch um but then all that's all it took to prop him up over five-star recruit wide receivers like, it doesn't make any sense to me yeah um, and yet it, and yet it's, it, it's gonna, I feel like it continues to happen. Uh, and I think it will, will likely continue to be a trend and it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see as the season goes along, how, how these players value changes and holds and how much adjustment gets made to what's going on. Cause when you look at, when you look at this past week, like that list that we talked about, I mean, Evan Stewart, Luther Burden, Ted McMillan had absolute banger games this week, um, all of them, and were yeah. the primary tar- were the clear primary targets on their team over other solid former four or five star high high level recruit type guys on their teams. Uh, I mean, Burden in Missouri, you can argue, but uh, but they were all, they all crushed. Antonio Williams looks great, and anyone who watched the Clemson Duke game. You just saw him knifing all over the field, showing an absolute NFL game. And so you watch these guys compared to Braylon Allen, who we were talking about pre-show, has, what is it, 12, 12 receptions, 32 yards? Is that what it is? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, like it's just, it's really interesting to see how this has, how this has gone and how this has flipped so quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And Rocket Sanders is he's a guy we talked about. He came in at like 242 pounds, is hurt already, was not impressive week one. 
he did have a really good season last year and in the SEC, which is yeah. a good sign. But if you're following like people on Twitter or the draft experts and those guys doing early mocks and guys that are really plugged into the league, there's no talk of him in those circles. There's no talk of him in draft circles. He's not someone that's getting buzz. He's not someone that they talk about in a short list of four or five guys that are going to be guys taken early in day two or whatever the case was. And that was coming off of his big season last year. So now he's he's a guy that was – he was like a top five pick in Debian C2C this year. And I just don't know – like I don't know that there's ever going to be a window to recoup that value at this point. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. And he – What's interesting, too, if you look at if you even looking at the NFL and the way that running backs specifically are translating and what they're looking for. Look, first of all, there's no such thing as a bell cow anymore. We can we can basically say that concept is mostly gone. Uh, it's 90 percent gone and going to continue to move its way out. And the guys, look, Bijan and Gibbs going incredibly high. Charbonnet slipped in the second round, which at the time when the pick was made, I think everybody collectively said, what are the Seahawks doing? And watching the Seahawks yesterday, it was pretty clear they had a myriad of needs that were higher priority than grabbing a second running back when Walker also is good. But regardless, it's just, it's interesting to see. And as we think about, Debbie and positional value. I think there's a class argument here, and there's also a straight positional argument for wide receivers as the most valuable asset in Debbie. And yeah, young I think it's not only valuable, but but also projectable too. I yes. think it's it's there's earlier signs for the wide receivers uh, for you to buy in, but I think even like. Even going back to like like I said during the classes, I think people need to get more comfortable. I think it's happening now, but people need to get more comfortable with the unknown versus the known. Yes. And you have to target these guys. You have to target the, the Zachary branches and the five star incoming freshmen. You have to target them early, or you're never going to get value returned on them. We saw this back a couple, even a couple years ago with like Emeka Buka. I want to say Marvin, Marvin Harrison wasn't a top. <laughs> Or he was like a 14th ranked wide receiver. Um, but you saw this going back. They weren't even taken in like standard Debbie drafts, or they were like tail end, like fourth and fifth round guys when it was, and they're like, like Buka was the wide receiver one in the class and a five star. Like, there's no way you should be letting those guys just slip away. You need to invest in those guys. If you go back and look at all the all the drafts of the guys who were taking them ahead of them, it's it's pretty crazy. Like guys who are just wide receivers who are day three wide receivers or UDFA guys. And some of them didn't even have the profiles to project the draft capital. They were still just a hope that, oh, they, if this guy pans out or hits a ceiling this year, he could go in the second or third round of the NFL draft. There's, to me, there's no way you should be passing on five-star incoming recruits, especially going to blue blood schools with histories of producing NFL wide receivers. There's no way you should be passing on those guys. Yeah, I think that's entirely right. And the truth is, we could have we could have added twenty uh, we could have added current freshman class of twenty six eligible wide receivers to this conversation because if you drafted Zachariah Branch, if you drafted Deuce Robinson, you drafted Nicholas Harbor had a really nice catch and and starting to show some form. And we'll we've talked about this a little bit, but uh, and we want to do a, a feature of the show on, on the year one zero idea, but with those freshmen in order for the freshmen to remain viable after their freshman year, the threshold for what they have to do in terms of production is so low for them to be meaningful going into their second year statistically. And so it's interesting about all the guys we listed falling so far is that they, they not only met the minimum criteria, but they crushed it last year. And we were still picking the game apart. Yeah. Yeah, we're still settling for guys who at best are second round draft picks as running backs, likely third yeah. round draft picks. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me. 
But I think that's part of the thing. I think it's part of the the mindset of people, uh, which I tried saying before, like it's like you're never gonna fix a bad draft on the NFL side strictly through Debbie. It's it'll it would take it'll take forever. Like you wanna use these guys to supplement your NFL squad, whether it's packaging two or three of them together to get a premium NFL asset or packaging them together to get a premium Debbie asset and having that one that one, one guy like the like the, this draft class coming up has like Caleb Caleb Williams and Marvin Hissa Jr. and Bauer, Brock Bowers, those guys are going to be premium assets the second they step on the field. So if you're if you get a guy like that's what should be your goal is to do whatever it takes to get a guy like that, whether it's through the startup draft or through trading other pieces, Debbie pieces to acquire one of them. Having one of those guys hit your NFL squad and and hit their ceiling and be a meaningful contributor on your NFL squad is all you want from your Debbie or even C2C, all your incoming guys. That's that's all you want. It's one one of those guys. But people think they're gonna load up on all these picks and have six or seven guys and transform their NFL squad. It, it, it's just not gonna happen. Yeah, it's frankly the same, it's the same logic of why you shouldn't trade a top three pick in an NFL rookie draft for four second rounders, for example. That's just not. Like I don't want those odds. I, I rather, I rather take the odds. I rather even take the odds and miss on a top three pick than have four yeah. darts and one of them maybe hits. Um, just really interesting. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and how the how that changes over time, and how the 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 class profiles sort of change over time, and whether I do think that as more and more people get into the space and get more comfortable with the space, you will see more risk taking and more willingness to dive into some of these younger classes. And I know we're promoting that idea by featuring incoming freshmen every single episode. That's something that we've talked about being really passionate about for, for listeners to the show to get access to that and to start being familiar with these, five, like we're going to do two more five-star receivers today. Like you, we need everyone who's in this format needs to know who those incoming five stars are and be familiar with their names, a little bit of their games, and be willing to kind of take a risk on that. So getting, uh, going forward, we definitely want to hit some more stock up, stock down reactions to this past weekend. One of the topics that we want to talk about is the 24 class. And we want to talk about, we're going to talk about both the QB and the wide receiver group from the 24 class we just hit on a little bit the 24 running backs where we're seeing the 24 running backs as a general stock down for the group actually if i had to pick one that i think is the stock i feel most comfortable with at the moment it's probably actually will shipley but that's another conversation um if i'm if i'm being honest which is funny because will shipley got faded more than basically anyone in that class going in and now he looks maybe the best the most stable next to Travion with the talent, but the 24 QB class. So you mentioned Caleb and Marvin Harrison Jr. And Drake May has been the 103, the consensus 103 for Debbie and C2C drafts all off season. And just looking at his game this past weekend and also the games of guys like Quinn Ewers, JJ McCarthy, Jackson Dart even, Michael Penix Jr. is doing wild things. Riley Leonard just wowed the nation and ran all over Clemson. Is Drake May the QB2 for sure? Is he the locked and loaded QB2 for the 24 class? I don't know. And I've been on this train for a while. Like I said, when I did I did campus life with the C2C guys, and he was my pick for who hurts their stock the most and it's not a shot at him and it's not i don't know if it's technically hurting his stock um but i do i've had questions all along about people propping him up as this surefire top five nfl draft prospect and i just don't know if it's there and i don't know but if it was ever there and i certainly know it's not something that's set in stone like people wanted to say it was to this point i've got a lot a lot of pushback on it too um I don't know if it's just people that are invested in him or what. It kind of feels like 
we just we always like Caleb was so far ahead of everyone that people get bored or they just want to want to know who's next. They want to be either right on who's next or they just want to talk about the next guy because they're bored of talking about Caleb Williams. Uh, you saw it this off season. They had there was lots of people who had up with Caleb Williams. Some people had over yes. Caleb Williams, um, which is kind of crazy to me, but uh, it was there. But going back to last year, I talked about this. He was not good down the stretch the last four games last year. Uh, and then to start this year, he's been kind of average. Um, so, like, the last his last six games, he's 134 for 218. So, 61% completion percentage. 1,386 yards, which is 231 yards per game. 6.4 yards per attempt with six touchdowns, six interceptions. So, over six games, which is... And four of them were lost. They lost the last four games to close out last year. And so that's pretty mediocre output, not only for your CFF squad if you're playing C2C, but just overall in general. And yesterday they played App State, who is a G5 school. Mm -hmm. They went to double overtime, and he had, I think, 208 yards, I believe, on like 30 attempts. Yeah, 208 yards on 30 attempts with no touchdowns. They went to double overtime with the G5 school. So I know it, it always seems like we're being overly critical on these guys, but I think when it comes to the quarterbacks, you have to be, especially when you expect an NFL team to highly invest the pick and the money going forward, that you got to expect these guys to elevate the talent around them. I know we got lots of like lots of excuses about Tess Walker not playing who we don't even know what he'd be at this level. He was a G5 transfer right. up wide receiver. So we don't know if he's right. a big impact guy or not at the, at this level. Um, but you expect a guy who's in contention for a top five NFL draft pick quarterback to be able to elevate what's around him. And it just doesn't seem like he's doing that at this rate. And on the other side was Quinn Ewers, who last week we talked about, and I talked about, you know, it's time to start asking the hard questions with Quinn Ewers and, he answered them this weekend. He looked really good against Alabama. What he did that single game performance in that spot against Alabama on national television um, is that single game performance is more impressive than anything we've seen from Drake May in his time over the last year and whatever, last 16 games or so. So there was always this spot where I said the reason I wasn't comfortable with Drake May and his cost, his acquisition cost, was not only was I never going to take him above Marvin Harrison Jr., which people people were, a lot of people were. It was kind of a coin toss at that 2-3 yeah. spot. Um, but people <clears throat> say it's super flex, so the positional need and the positional value, and there's just, just no way there's, I was never going to do that. But I said all along that I'm still more comfortable with even the other guys, like the Emeka Bukas, Judkins, uh, Nick Singleton, even Travion, if you still believe in him and still have that. I was always more comfortable with those guys in that range and having Drake May at the 107, 108 spot, which I never got him because he was gone way before that. But I've always said that there's a better chance that a second or third, someone else comes up and hops, leapfrogs Drake May as the QB2 in the class than there is of anyone hopping over Martin Harrison Jr. as the wide receiver one or even Agbuka as the wide receiver two for me. So I just was never willing to pay that pay that price for it. Now we've seen this Quinn Ewers performance. And if he keeps this rolling, there's it's going to be a real conversation whether it's him or May for QB2. And then JJ McCarthy's looked really good. He's a former five-star recruit. He's, you know, he has a real solid opportunity with Michigan to play in the playoffs and the national championship. So basically all he has to do is play mistake-free football, which he's pretty been pretty good at. Uh, then he gets into the conversation, and then, then what do we do? Then those that, that acquisition cost and that, that outlook for Drake May gets muddy in a hurry. And that's even in just a couple of names. Uh, you see, Michael Phoenix at Washington is putting up historic numbers and throwing, showing an NFL arm all over the field, frankly. And he was another former top recruit who transferred uh, and has some injury concerns but has looked incredible. Riley Leonard looked great. Uh, and he's definitely could throw himself into, into a conversation about this. There's 
it's the the QB two three situation is interesting because there are so many potential. There are so many ways it would go. We didn't even mention Jordan Travis, Shadur Sanders, who also are getting tons of buzz and their names are growing. And we have seen this happen. There is recent historical evidence to show that we don't know what's going on. Two years ago, there was nobody at this time who thought Zach Wilson and Trey Lance were going to be the QB2 and QB3 behind Trevor Lawrence. That was not in the conversation. It was just simply not on the radar. And that's not the first, that's not the only time it's happened. It's just kind of the most recent where we saw that take place and where we saw QB come from, whether it's even a smaller school or a little bit out of nowhere and have a run and the NFL fall in love with them through a series of workouts and a series of process and then take them over. Nobody had them over fields. Nobody had that in conception. Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields were the one and two QBs of that class so firmly for so many years. And then it got blown up. So what we're talking about, I actually don't think is, I don't think it's crazy. I don't think it's wild to assume Mm -hmm. there's recent evidence that it could easily happen. And there's a lot of names in this QB class. There may be, there may be 12 QBs taken in the first four rounds this year. I mean, I, I could see that. I could see that happening with the value on the position and with the number of talented guys there are in this class. Yeah, we've seen it with Anthony Richardson this past year. We saw it two years yeah. ago with, like I said, like the DJU and Rattler going into the year with one or two picks. Yeah. Sam Howell, Sam Howell went to the fifth round and Kenny Pickett came out of nowhere and went in the first round. Like yeah. it, it happens a lot with the quarterback position. I talked about it a couple episodes when I talked about the article I did on the recruiting status and how it plays into the roles down the road. And the quarterback position is wild. It's one of those spots where guys come out of nowhere and get draft capital. It doesn't happen in any other position. Like you see, we see wide receivers come out of nowhere and go undrafted or day three guys and then earn a role and then blow up. Quarterbacks are the only ones that get draft capital. And it, it happens all the time. Yeah, it's it's absolutely true. And I think just from a stock perspective, when we say that the cl- the twenty, I would say the stock of the twenty four QB class overall to me is up because the quality of QB play has been. I mean, men, I, names keep coming like Bo Nix, Michael Pratt was injured this weekend, but if he wasn't, actually, I think Tulane has a shot against Ole Miss because they looked great. And yeah. if he was in there, I don't know what would have happened. I, they there are a lot of guys, and you think about it, Sean Clifford got what was it fifth round draft capital this year like Something all of like these that. guys are better than sean clifford I, I this is where i just think there are this is such a deep qb class with so much talent that uh it's going to be really interesting to see how it how it plays out and that the qb2 situation is not necessarily there and the fact is the gap between that the, the important thing to remember is like the gap, but Caleb Williams is in a very different class from Drake May. And it's not, it's not really close. The, the level of production that he's shown his game, it's just actually not close. And Drake May is closer to those other guys than he is to Caleb Williams. And that's going to be the interesting thing to play out. And one of them could be the third overall pick in the draft, the second overall pick in the draft. Someone, someone could pull a Zach Wilson. We don't know that. But the gap between Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson was enormous. And that wasn't close for anyone who really knew, Yeah, I think. So interesting. And I know we also want to hit on the 24 wide receiver class as a stock up situation. Yeah, I think the group as a whole is, has performed really well. Um, I know I talked about it earlier. There's a lot of bigger bodies in this class, which we didn't see last year. We saw a bunch of slot guys go. But I think the number of guys that will go on day two, there's a a really good grouping uh and like we've talked about this for a couple of years in this spot where last year it was like the sammy Watkins and aj greens and those type of guys and this year it's you see brandon cooks and like tyler boyd is still around and you saw odell Beckham get 15 million dollars there's a spot for these guys there's a desperate need in the league for nfl wide receivers and every team like i'm a giants fan like we have no our, the team has nobody not a single wide receiver on the team that's worth a lick. 
like there's job opportunities for all these guys. And I think even last, like we've seen Marvin Harrison and Emeka have had really good games this week. Uh, Zero Worthy looks sort of back to his freshman season and he's got a trump card, which I think is going to get him in the first round. He's got four, like four, three speed. Uh, yeah. I kind of comp him to, he has that like Deshaun Jackson type of like easy gliding acceleration that an NFL team is going to fall in love with. He, as long as his hands can keep up this year, he's just the, the best vertical threat in the in the in the draft. Malik Neighbors had a kind of mediocre start to the season, but he's he was really good last year. Troy Frank, Franklin has been really good to start the season. He looks really uh, and good. And then you get into like the like Adonai Mitchell's a guy that I've been really high on that I know like has been talked about in draft circles. You got both the Washington guys, McMillan and Odun and Odunzi have been really good. Bo Collins had a big resurgence this week. DeAndre Lambert Smith looks like he's the guy at Penn State. Roman Wilson's been balling out at Michigan. Those guys, those senior guys from those blue blood programs, they're going to have the opportunity to roll out this senior bowl and get noticed. They're going to get day two draft capital, maybe day three. And I just think that this group overall, the depth is better than people gave it credit for and better than last year. I think these guys like, are better than the Xavier Hutchinson's and the Michael Wilson's and the guys we saw get the draft capital last year. I just think there's a spot for a, a whole bunch of these guys. I couldn't agree more. And the size point is huge. Just looking at that list, I mean, uh, Marvin, Marvin's obviously got the size. Troy Franklin has, uh, Troy Franklin is 6'2". He's not a, okay. he's thin, but he's 6'2". So he's got, he's got height and wingspan. Um, <clears throat> you've got Keon Coleman, who's Keon Coleman, yeah. charging on strong, but has size. Ad Mitchell has the size. J. Michael Sturdivant has this. You've got you've got some you've got some guys that are that are that are going to fill a void that wasn't there necessarily in this past class. And I agree with you. We just named one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. We named Bo Collins is another one who has had a really nice start to the year. Former, another former really high recruit. I yeah, a guy that I've been really high on for a long time. So it's nice to see him kind of panning out. But he's a, yeah. another guy. He's a six foot four, six three, six four guy. Really good athlete. Really good mover for his size. I just, I think there's a lot of guys in this in this class. Yeah, it's interesting, and all. A lot of the guys that we're mentioning right now, just from a talent perspective, you even think about the guys that went in the second last year, Jonathan Mingo, Jaden Reed, you mentioned Wilson in the third. I, you you just, you kind of look and you think, man, this group is, like, I, I like the depth. I like even the depth of that group after sort of wide receiver six, seven over some of those guys that were top last year. Yeah, and most of them are real high pedigree recruits too. They're all kind of coming together. Like uh, it helps to have the two Washington kids who came back for their senior years, but they were both real high, real high recruits. And I know people are people are really high on Odunzi, who I don't think I don't know. I kind of got a tweet bookmark of his measurables, but I don't think he's the athlete that people claim he is. I agree with that. Um, but he's not, uh, he's a good size speed guy but he's not the size speed guy that people claim he is but um he's he's another guy that i think he's going to be a like a second round guy people i know a lot of people want to push him up into the first round and people had him as their wide receiver three in the class i don't think it's there i think if the league was that high on him he would have went last year because he would have filled a really big need last year and he had a big a big season but the one thing with those two is that their production came right in, in tow with Penix and um, DeBoer, the head coach there, Brandon yeah, the assistant coach, yeah. who was at Fresno State before, who's who's put up huge numbers wherever he goes. So their raw stats are really nice, but like on the peripheral. But if when you dig into it a lot, I don't think they they both have like the they're not in the upper level of the metrics that you're looking at. But they both had really nice seasons and really nice starts to the season. Yeah. So yeah, I think that I think those guys being there helps the class and the depth. And I think when you get down to it and you have these 10, 12 guys who are all high four-star recruits, five-star recruits all come together at the same time. I think it makes a really, really nice class that's kind of going under the radar at this point. 
Yeah, I think it absolutely is. And especially when you have these, you know, the Wilson Lambert Smith breakouts as well. <clears throat> McMillan's an interesting one too, because he doesn't get as much buzz as O'Dunsey. Uh, and I, I understand, I think his measurables in some ways are better than O'Dunsey's for the next level. The thing with him is to your system point, I did a very peripheral, not as in-depth as I would like to eventually sort of mini tape review of his. And the, the one thing I'll say about him is that he's 95% of what I saw was out of the slot and basically variations on very similar plays. So I'm, I want to see him do more within that system and outside the system, but he's an interesting guy. And I think you're right. All these guys just add depth to that class that make it, it's going to be a really interesting situation. And we see how the NFL values wide receivers. So I could see six going in the first round this year easily. Yeah. I would not be, I would not be shocked for it. We had three went last year, four went last year, four went four, last yeah. year, four. back to back oh, yeah. to back to back. And I think this class is deeper and better. And the year before the same thing happened in the teams, it was just, it just went wide receiver, wide receiver. There were six of them, six between 10 and 20 in a class before, I think five, at least five, but it, it, it could, we could be looking at that situation again with all these high recruits and Marvin being a different level prospect, even than we've seen in a number of years. Yeah, I think so. Um, all right, stock down. Who's on your stock down list? Uh, I threw Kate Klubnik on there. Uh, he just, uh, I, I've never been, I've never been yeah. a big Kate Klubnik guy. I, there, I, I always, I've always from the beginning preferred Wegman. I think his game is much more interesting and better. I obviously prefer LR. Uh, I, Klubnik though has looked out of his element a little bit if i'm being nice yeah yeah i was never a big a big huge club guy and uh he's also like six three like 174 pounds something like that uh and they actually struggled this week to start they ended up putting up a bunch of points but they struggled to start against a really bad really weak competition uh so yeah i would kind of agree with that also on my with sticking with the receivers i had Alabama pass catchers on my stock down. I don't want anything to do with any of them, the entire group. Like the ghost of Jermaine Burton is the guy leading the leading the troops so far this year. Um Kobe Prentice had an okay game this year, but I've never been high on him as as a recruit. Isaiah Bond is the one guy I kind of liked last year who's like a track star and a really good like field scratcher type guy, but he's had like one long catch in both the games so far. Uh, Milrow, surprise, surprise, came crashing back down because he's not a, even a collegiate level passer, I don't think, let alone an NFL passer. So I wouldn't be surprised if they go to Ty Simpson at some point this year to just figure out what's going on for the long haul because it's I don't think it's Milrow. There's even a potential that they went with Milrow for this reason too, that they knew the Texas Week 2 game was going to be a tough game for their squad and that maybe they didn't want to throw Ty Simpson into that fire right off the hop. Uh, but I mean, once you get into an SEC competition, it's going to get stiff anyways. So uh, I think they, I thought they would try and hide this with the run game a little bit more, but they, Jason McCall only had like 12 touches or 12 carries this week, which I don't understand. He's looked pretty good when they gave him the ball. I thought they would have tried to run the ball a ton more and kind of control the clock and control game scripts and whatnot, but I don't know. But yeah, all those guys are like, I don't think Ja'Cory Brooks has even played yet this year. I didn't see him show up on any stats he's the one guy i was kind of holding out hope for there he's he kind of fits the mold of these guys in this in this class he's a five star he's six foot three 200 pound kid good possession receiver he's had some big plays in big games the last couple of years he did lead them last year in receiving i believe but he didn't take the big step that everyone thought he was going to dominate and have one of those thousand yard sophomore seasons and blitnikoff type seasons but he he did have an okay season and he was on a okay trajectory if he was the guy there this year uh but i don't know what the, i don't know what the story is with him i don't think he's played at all and then uh, i know people were malik benson was a guy that people were drafting really high in startups and supplementals this year yep. and he was just going to walk on and dominate coming from juco and i think he had an okay game this 
this week as well. But nobody's nobody's lighting the world on fire there. There's not enough volume to for anyone to cement their place in the rankings, and it's just it's an absolute void for me. I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, I'm with you. If I have anyone in that room, I want Bond. He's the most interesting to me uh, of any of them. And he did have a good first week and then had one catch this past week and came crashing down to earth a little bit. Are you concerned about the running backs? I was going to ask you that. You kind of mentioned it a little bit. But I, I'm, I also find myself confused because just looking at that room and how loaded it is, my thought was also that they would go. And I, I just don't totally understand what to what to make of that. Yeah, I don't I don't know what the deal is there. It's like I I've been pretty vocal about Jason McClellan. Like I think he's I think he's a chance to get to the running back two of this class. He's like if you go back to like the Nike opening in high school, he was like the top athlete there. He's like 5'11, 212 pounds, ran a four five ish in high school. Uh decent catching the ball out of the backfield. He looks even better in between the tackles when they let him run this year. Uh even go back to last year, he was a little bit. Uh, share the field Gibbs he's I thought they would I thought they would lean on him I thought he would be like a top 10 back for CFF this year and they would just he'd be getting the 20 touches a game that we've seen we've seen Saban and Orbe, these guys like the Najis and the, even Brian Robinson who was like a subpar athlete just those guys that have stayed the course and stayed committed to the team for the four-year haul they've all got these big workloads their last year and it's not happening so far and the talent there is is unbelievable. They could go like I'm a big Jan Miller guy. Justin Sainz and Richard Young both came in this year. Are both really solid. Even Royal Williams, I think, was a four star. Like, he's not spectacular, but he's you know he could be a even a body in an NFL room at this at this point. Like I just don't I don't understand what they're doing. It's it's quite confusing. Yeah, it's it's definitely confusing, and the overall direction is a real question for that program in terms of how they're going to manage this QB situation all year and how they're going to game plan, especially after that loss. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how they, how they respond to that. Are you, are you at all concerned about Quinshawn Judkins first couple games this year? He has, he has not looked like what people drafted him for at the mid ones of, of startup drafts. And I got, I got to watch some of the, some of the Ole Miss two-lane game, I, some of it was there really wasn't a lot of running room. And I'm not sure if potentially the Ole Miss O-line has taken a hit or if something has happened scheme-wise, but he really, he didn't, he didn't look bad and it wasn't that he was written out of the game plan, but I am sure Judkins owners are a little concerned with the start just because it wasn't what they were expecting at all. And it wasn't against run defenses I would have anticipated slamming the door. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not certain what's going on. Like Jackson Darts looked good to start the year, and yes. like, it was weird that they came out with that like that first scripted uh, scripted series. They looked unbelievable. Like they scored like in 48 seconds or something. Like that he was three for three for like 60 something yards and a touchdown right off the right off the hop. And then things got dicey. Their offensive line was. I think it could be the issue because Dart got blown up a couple times where he got he did. just hammered trying to get throws off. And yeah, it didn't look like Judkins had a ton of rush rushing room. He's uh he's a guy I was high like last year coming out. He was my like, RB six or something in the class, and he was like a RB forty something in the rank, like yeah. coming out of his recruiting class. Uh, so he's a guy I liked a lot more. Uh, it's it is something we've talked about. I've talked with some guys in the discords and stuff about his he's kind of like a Kareem Hunt to me, like I kind of comp him to. Mm. And like it, people keep saying he outplayed Zach Evans last year. He he got more volume than Zach Evans. But if you look at their metrics and their numbers, they were pretty similar. They pretty much did the same thing. Judkins just, just got more of a volume for whatever reason. And his biggest strength is, is like his physicality and his durability. Like he wasn't blowing the world out last year. He just got a ton of volume. And he was really good around the goal line, scored a bunch. He's a decent receiver. Um, but his his athleticism, I think, is a question mark going forward to the NFL. I don't know that he's a difference-making kind of athlete. So there's that to look at. But I don't think it's time to worry about anything yet. But yeah, I, I would imagine it's the offensive line that's 
that's the issue so far. They they did not look great. And Tulane's a top 25 team, but I was surprised that they hung in there without Pratt. I was really surprised. I was as well. I did not expect them to do that. And I think it's, it's a, t- listen, it's a testament to how strong that program is. And the fact that they've really, they have really taken a leap to be able to hang with, with elite competition overall and not being, being able to do it without Pratt was a huge statement for them. So I give them props for that. That was a big, that was a big deal. And they, they belong in the top 25. I'll say that much for it. And um, one of the games I was looking most forward to, and I don't really, I don't actually really have any huge stock downs from this game, but the Texas A&M Miami game, it's interesting. We talked about all these QBs already. Uh, Tyler Van Dyke looked back to two years ago, Tyler Van Dyke, when everyone had him in that QB three conversation, which was interesting. Yeah. And I know Eric Furton actually said that on the on the Dynasty DGEMS pod. He he mentioned that he was scooping up a lot of Van Dyke, and he looked great. Colby Young is a receiver we didn't talk about who looked who's eligible twenty four and looked really good and he's 6'5", 225 yeah. and incredibly fast and the AM offense i don't think anybody i don't think the loss makes you take a hit on anyone on the AM offense i think they're still getting their bearings in this new system they were still flinging it all around the field wegman had 33 completions stewart noah thomas so they were really good too uh really interesting weekend though and it'll be interesting to see how this how this all plays out should we jump into yeah, Evan Stewart's a really interesting kid in that he's the top, he was the wide receiver one of his class for most of it. The five star kid out of Texas. I think he, he's a little undersized and he didn't play senior high school. So I think there's a little bit lost there. People were a little bit down on him, but it, for some reason, people don't want to go in on him. So no one's not no one, there's people around, but I mean, He's not getting the same talk as you'd think a kid of his caliber is because once this class graduates, he's the lead guy. He's going to be the Debbie wide receiver one next year. He's firmly in that position where it's him, Burden, Ted McGillen, or probably, or Zachary Brinks. There's, there's like a short list of guys that are going to be, and I would think Stewart with what he's doing now and his pedigree is going to be the guy. Right now, like I would lean that way now. He would be my wide receiver one in all of Debbie after this this class, class graduates. But it's I'm people, with it. I'm people with were hundred percent. People were hesitant to push it. Like I got pushed back from taking him in the the end of the first round in drafts. So I was taking him at the he was still around the 112, 201 turn. There's a lot of like going back to the point earlier about going to the head of the clock. There was drafts where I drafted at the turn on purpose, choosing that spot. And I doubled down and took Stewart and Burton as my the 112-201 on yep. purpose. Pass ones, and then next year comes around, you got two bullets in the gun for the top wide receiver in the entire draft class. And it's just the way I like to do things. And I don't think I don't know why there's pushback on it or why people people are slow to come around on it. But he's not he's he's not being talked about in that same breath as as past guys who would be that Debbie wide receiver one. No, he isn't. And, and still the whole class is, I think just not getting like McMillan should be getting more talk now. McMillan should be absolutely a guy that's going around that turn next year at this rate right now. He should be a guy that's going just as a Debbie wide receiver three, because you're going to have a class that's even more top heavy, I think potentially than, even this year in terms of having a few guys that fit into that, into that top list. And I think he's going to go around the turn early second round and just doesn't get, just doesn't get the talk, doesn't get the buzz. And it's the time to invest on those guys now. So if they're available, if you can get them, get them because their value is only going to increase as time goes on. Yeah, yeah, it's I've mentioned it over and over. Like the time, the time to buy guys in Devi is early. You can't wait. You can't yeah. wait and see. I know people ask people say, "Well, I need to see something first. What? You can't you, in the format. You can't, or you'll be left behind mm-hmm. because you're always going to pay a premium 
for the value. You're never gonna you're never gonna get an increase in value. You're gonna be buying at people out their ceilings, and there's no way to win that way. That's right. That's absolutely right. Uh, so speaking of buying guys early, we have dedicated some time in each of these shows to talk about next man up and to preview incoming freshmen that are still currently high school seniors. Todd, do you want to go first this week? Sure. Uh, so my guy is another 24 freshman uh, receiver. It's TJ Moore from, he's from, plays at Tampa Catholic in Tampa, Florida. He's a guy that I was on real early. Um, I don't know if you, if you're not in the Debbie Royal Discord, you should be. Those guys have been tremendous and growing the Debbie space and giving people voices and whatever. They were really, really, I've been there a long time. And those guys, Kevin and, and Christian and, and Jeff were kind enough to let me post my my early 24 freshman rankings in the Debbie Royale Discord. So we I got the, we added a recruiting channel because I'm always digging into these guys and just want somewhere to talk about it. So they gave me the opportunity. So I posted when I dug into these guys and started my class, I started posting my rankings in there. I did my whole like top 50 guys or whatever. And he was a guy back in April that he was the wide receiver 46, I believe, in the class at the time. And I posted in there and said, this is a kid that I don't understand his ranking. And by the end of his senior year, I'd imagine he's far, far ahead of where he is at that point, which was yeah, 46, I believe. Uh, and he had a ton of offers, uh, like from big schools too. So when they did the big ranks update, he's now like up to wide receiver 20 in the composite. And I had him as my wide receiver 17 back in April, but I could easily see him finishing as a top 10 to 12 wide receiver in the class, maybe even higher. Uh, he's a really interesting kid. So he's like 6'3", 190. Uh, he's a big downfield vertical threat. Really, really fluid mover for his size. Really, really excellent ball skills. Good route runner. Uh, shows really good field awareness to, on the boundaries and, you know, running his routes to the first down markers, that type of stuff. Uh, he is a little lean and add, needs to add some play strength, but, I mean, that'll come. He's a 17-year-old, 18-year-old kid. I think he's one of the younger players in the entire class too, which is nice. Uh, last year he had 42 catches for just over a thousand yards and 13 touchdowns. This year in three games he has 14 catches for 421 yards and six touchdowns. So he's on a really nice path to keep climbing up those rankings. And I'm not sure if he's committed or not yet. Actually, I'll have to look into that. I don't think I think he's still uncommitted. Interesting. But he's a Florida kid as well, so he plays decent competition. So, so he's a he's a kid I like to be a riser come next year. TJ Moore, hard commit Clemson. Oh, he's from Clemson. Clemson. Oh, I, mean, I, I think they might have like solidified him after after Cam Coleman flipped to A and M. I think yeah, they might have gotten that's right. it. So that's a good spot too. He fits that mold of fits that mold of guys that uh they've put out in clumps and they kind of go with that six foot three guy. They've had a good history of them over the years. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that that team is gonna be so interesting to see how how this evolves over this year with Dabo and Garrett Riley there, because it's I, I just see I don't, it's watching so far, it's sort of why'd you hire Garrett Riley if you're not going to let him actually play the game that you hired him to play? And you just don't see that happening. And you see a lot of lack of confidence and what seems like uncertainty from a lot of players, especially Klubnik. And I think that goes straight up to the top. So that'll be very interesting to watch. But for a top recruit, for a top five star receiver, it's still a place you want to, a place you want to be. And Look, people change their recruits. People change their commitments all the time too. So if something goes down, who knows? Invest in talent early. Yeah, it's that Clemson, that Clemson thing has been weird. It's like it's like Dabble pushing back with people criticizing him, and he he just hired Garrett Riley in name and is still not letting him do his thing, which is really weird. And the whole him not going to the, the transfer portal and stuff, they have a real chance of just getting buried as a program in the next year or so if they don't start. Start embracing the new, the new thing. 
you can only live off past performance for so long in that cultures i don't know if you're going to get kids to buy into that whole system absolutely um so for my for my next man up i chose mike matthews who is another five star wide receiver for this incoming class he's committed to tennessee he's from georgia uh, he's a two-way player, so he plays both offense and defense. He plays receiver, and he plays defensive back, and uh, had really good numbers as a junior, 48 catches, 1,031 yards, 10 touchdowns, and uh, 23 tackles, two interceptions on defense, also plays basketball. Uh, his, tape is re- his tape is really interesting to me. He plays in Georgia, and he's a, he's a consensus five-star and is going to Tennessee. You have to pay attention to him. His tape's interesting to me because, so first of all, he looks he looks on tape bigger than he measures, like he measures six feet and a half, 180. He looks bigger and plays a little bigger than that size would indicate to me. I think some of that is competition that he's against where he's playing against some smaller guys, but he looks incredibly big and his his contested catch stuff is fantastic. His body control is great. What I love about watching him, I always look for this, especially in the high school guys is just that they they're moving him around and lining him up everywhere and throwing to him from everywhere. So he's got a pretty diverse route tree and a pretty diverse profile of where he's lining up. You'll see him in the slot. You'll see him out wide. You'll see him doing stuff that big guys do big fades in the end zone. You'll also see him slip into the slot with quick outs, which I really like. Love his physicality after the catch. He is not afraid of contact and he will just kind of go at guys. I think he's a little bit, a little bit less refined on the receiver side. And uh, in terms of some of the nuances of route running, and I would like to see him get better with that. He has a real easy speed to him though. And he just kind of glides and then he just leaves everybody in the dust and he's, he's totally been an over the top guy, at least in high school. And Tennessee is an interesting place for him because that wide receiver room is about to have a big turnover. So I think there's about to be some big opportunity coming into next year. And he kind of fits the, like, I look at him and I, I thought, I thought a little bit of Jalen Hyatt, but potentially I think he could potentially even be a little bit better coming in earlier. He's got some of those traits of Jalen Hyatt where you just see him taking the top off guys and he's got a similar, he's a little bigger than Hyatt, but uh, he looks like that type of player. And I'm interested and excited to see him see how he does with Tennessee and see if he can come in and take, take some early work there and maybe build a connection with Nico. Cause I just think that room is going to be up for the taking and watching Tennessee through two games this year, I am going to, I'm interested, like, they did not look, they, they just don't, they don't look phenomenal at all. And I am going to be interested as the year goes along, once they start playing real competition to see whether they at any point transition to start to see what some of the younger guys can do for them and start to give some of these freshmen a little bit more play. They played Alcorn State and they didn't even get their freshmen in. Because it was, they won, I think they ended up winning 30 to 13, but they didn't get their freshmen in that game very much. And you're like, Tennessee Alcorn State should be essentially a scrimmage, and it was not. Yeah, so we talked about this a little that. last week that maybe flipping in those guys, those, those one for one pieces aren't as seamless as you'd think, like with that hypo offense. Like, Everyone wants a piece of the hype offense, and we talked about it for years, but maybe people weren't giving the Jalen Hyatts and the Hen Hookers enough credit, thinking that they were all just system guys. And, you know, like we said last week, they are NFL players. Whether they're going to be NFL stars is another thing, but they are NFL caliber players, and they're not as quite as easily replaceable as we thought they were. Mike Matthews is a guy I like, too. He's like my wide receiver four or five in the class, I believe. Yeah. Uh, he reminds me of Travis Hunter watching that. Actually, when I, oh, nice. yeah. when I put his tape on, he is like the same, like he jumps off as a already NFL caliber athlete and absolute elite ball skills and body crazy control. ball skills. And they have those similarities. So you can tell that playing the DB and the and wide receiver thing comes into play with both their tapes. 
and he's he's a little raw on the he's a little raw when it comes to the route running and the nuances of playing receiver. But I mean that's something that can come. And he does play really good. He plays in Georgia. He plays really really good competition. Um, so he's a guy. He's a guy. Like I know people are a little bit down on him, but he's yeah he gives me those Travis Hunter vibes, and it's hard to it's hard to get down to that level in high school of guys winning on athleticism it's hard for them to see like the absolute refinement when they can get away with being a little less physical on some of the stuff uh, but he's not he's not one of the guys that's only winning because he's an athlete it's just something that he's gonna have to clean up a little bit and i think tennessee is a smash play for him too yeah i agree i think that's uh, it's I, I think about tennessee in terms of future and i think hypo's gonna build a thing where that system is going to be able to take off and it's it's interesting to see it to see some of the growing pains this year, but I think it'll lead to success. I think it's a perfect room for him to walk into where he can, he can shine early. And yeah, I, I love his game too. And I, I love that he's just physical after the catch, man. Like he, he just, you just like, I watched him, I watched him take an out and instead of just going right out of bounds, turn up and just pop this safety and then just get in his face and start talking right afterwards. And it's like, he has that that Travis Hunter vibe, right? Like he has that, like he has a little bit of that vibe. I yeah. love seeing that in players. Yeah. Yeah. Also, right. I would throw this out there for a, a little bonus one. So don't take a whole segment talking about was Jeremiah Smith this week, if you missed his stat line, who if you don't know, you should know. Jeremiah Smith's the wide receiver one in the entire class and like the second or third player overall in the entire class. Uh going to Ohio State, five star kid. He had 300, 16 catches for 316 yards and three touchdowns this week, uh, which is absolutely bonkers, hilarious. Uh, so he's just the kid. Just throw that name out so people, if they're not quite into that range, he's not a guy what you, is know, you he, need to go deep on. You put the what's he ranked for you? Uh, is he two for He's you my wide receiver three in the class. Three. Yeah. But, I mean, there's, it's a tier. Those three guys are in a tier. You, you can take over your life. His teammate Trader at one who hasn't played the last two weeks for some reason. Uh, and then Michael Hudson, who I talked about last week, and then Jeremy yeah, Smith. I think they're all in a tier. Yes. And all three of them are in a tier above anyone for the last two classes for me. So he's super interesting. And he's really? a kid that uh he's he's been the number the wide receiver one in the class for like two years now. Um, uh, but he's a kid that was a noticeable from his sophomore to his junior tape was really noticeable that his him just growing into his body and his athleticism was just he was playing on a different level. He's uh he's like I think he's the state champion 400 meter hurdles or something like that. Six foot four, two hundred and whatever, two hundred five pounds. So he's an interesting kid. He's fun. He's a real fun Twitter follow too. He's he's pretty much trolled every school he's gone to. He's there's talk about Florida schools kind of trying to flip him, but he's been a hard commit to Ohio State forever. Every time he goes somewhere and takes does the recruiting thing and takes the photos and posts them on. Twitter and Instagram and people start talking or, well, we're getting them, we're getting them. And then like the yeah. next day he'll, he'll just post a picture of Heartline smoking a cigar. Like it's, he just does this every week. He's done it every, every trip he's taken. It's pretty funny. So I don't see him moving off of Ohio State. So uh, just Sounds like that he's not going to. people who are newer to the space. Yeah. So he's going to be the next guy up there. So super fun kid. Fantastic. That's, a, that's an unreal stat line. That's just. You yeah, can't even make that up. It's 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 high school football. There's so many, <laughs> so many fun games. Just like absolutely unbelievable, off the charts. Totally. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for us for this week with uh, with Debbie Dijens. But we will catch you back here again next week uh, for more Debbie C two C college football talk. And with that, we will. Say goodbye. I'm Noah Green. Todd Vincent. See you all next week. Yeah, have a good one. See you next week, guys. Uh huh. Yeah. The revolution, y'all. 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 Yeah. Yep. The revolution. The revolution, y'all, will not be televised.
Yeah, you gotta wake up, open your eyes Make a change in your life And find a new way of living It's time to start living for the children Everybody look into my life Tell me what you see The perseverance of a young man sitting is so free L.A. Mac, be the champ But still fighting the struggle They couldn't shut my mouth with a muzzle I'm hard to figure like a puzzle My name ought to be Jigsaw Rough around the edges I've been known to spit 